All right, a few days ago, I got what has to be the dumbest comment that I have ever seen in any of the comment sections on my videos. So yeah, let's get into it about uh, Chep. So Chuck Hellebuck runs Chep 3D Printer Channel, and he's just, I, he makes great content, you guys. Um, he's lucky enough to have found himself a niche here on YouTube. Uh, primarily, it's Kira. The, the slicer software and tips and tricks on Kira. And every Friday he would release a video. And nowadays the algorithm has changed. The YouTube algorithm is different. But when he was launching his channel, uh, the algorithm strongly favored absolute consistency that that people liked time and again, every, every week they would come back. It was just a really great way to grow a channel. And that's not to say that growing a channel on YouTube and successfully working the algorithm means that what you're saying is the truth and has validity, okay? So uh, sometimes I'm online and I see people lamenting the fact that you can't see the, the, um, the vote count, how many upvotes, how many downvotes. Well, the problem is, you guys, that popularity and truth also have nothing to do <laughs> with each other necessarily. Um, the crowd is often right. Like, um, who wants to be a millionaire? The crowd was right, um, like 90, probably like 95% of the time, like really, really high percentage of the crowd was the, the ask the audience, pull the audience. They were correct. But when the answers got more nuanced and more difficult, the higher value answers in who wants to be a millionaire, the crowd would often be wrong. So, uh, you can't rely on the vote tally either to find truth. And it's really hard to, to suss out truth. This is why we have the scientific process. Now, Chep, Tried to do a little science experiment, but he did it in the vein of his other tips and tricks. It was a five minute experiment. He literally just like measured the bed in five points and then spent, I mean, the experiment itself took like 10 minutes of his total time. And then making the video probably took, you know, two hours. It takes a long time to make videos. So uh, I understand why he did it. That's the way his channel works. It's these little snippets, little, little chunks, little things here and there, but you can't do science like that. Right? You have to come up with a hypothesis. It has to be a good hypothesis. You have to reason through it. You have to be thinking about it for days and days. Then you have to have to come up with a really good idea uh, of a way to test it. You know, there's, there's just a lot to science. Check out CNC Kitchen. If you guys want to see um, how you really do a scientific study, like he's just doing amazing scientific studies, of course. That's why he's got all the subscribers, right? Really fantastically polished videos too about uh, the studies that he does. So you can't do science in five minutes. You're going to proliferate bad information on the internet. And one of those things is that beds don't expand. They absolutely expand. Okay, so thermal expansion. Here's the Wikipedia article. You guys can go get all the good information, but that first paragraph says it all. Um, the tendency of most matter to expand when it gets hot, excepting phase transitions. Now, um, ice, water ice is interesting. Like, like um, yeah, H2O ice, because it expands as well. And it gets colder uh, and expands, which is strange, right? But that's that's the way that one goes. So that's a phase transition from a liquid to a solid, ice being the solid. So it's not just like a hard and fast rule that all things expand in the heat, but generally speaking, that's true. And aluminum is no exception. It absolutely expands in the heat. Got my pencil bag here, which is entirely made out of a zipper <laughs> all the way. We'll just get a couple of red and blue. Got my $20 super expensive pencil, only the best for you guys. So all things expand in the heat. If you have a circle, it's going to expand outward in the heat and look like this. I mean, that's an exaggeration, right? But you get the idea. It's probably going to be more like, you know, just barely expanded, but it's going to expand. It's going to grow outward. And if it's a sphere or a circle, then it's it's easy to visualize the expansion. However, when you start with a cube or a square, let's say, it's harder to intuitively know what's going to happen. You see, this material is at a baseline temperature. Then you're going to add uh, heat from the environment to all the sides and all the corners as well, right? So this heat is going to start at the outer edges, right? Just like so and it's gonna work its way inward. So inward on the inside, we're gonna have a core, but it's not a square core. It's kind of a square, but it's gonna kind of have rounded corners. So it's gonna be more of, of an oval shape, right? So you've got this ovaly coolness on the inside here, which is fighting against the heat. And so this coolness is kind of working its way outwards is one way to visualize it, while the heat is working its way inwards. And they're gonna meet and there's gonna be kind of a gradient temperature gradient from the very hot outside to the very cool inside. So the effect that this is gonna have 
uh, when it when it expands is the areas where the material is the most thick between the cool moment and the hot moment. In other words, here at the corners. See, that distance right there is the largest distance, so that's going to expand the most. So this here, when it grows, is going to grow like so. Right? It's not going to grow uniformly. But once the aluminum block is all a uniform temperature again, it will be an expanded square or cube once again with flat sides all over again. Now, another thing to consider when, uh, when doing temperature. Let's pretend that you have a top edge and a bottom edge. Now, what if I just applied heat to this side here, right? And this side up here had cold air blowing on it. What's going to happen, this side here is going to expand, and this side is going to shrink, right? The cold side is going to shrink. So the edges here, this edge here going inward, this edge here going outward. And since these two edges are attached, you know, to each other all the way through the material, all the way down the line, they're attached. They can't grow separate from one another. So what has to happen? Well, you get a gradient for just like above, right, where the red and the blue meet. So you get um, varying temperatures, which means the expansion is going to happen on a gradient as well through the thickness there. And the expanded line here is going to become bowed like so. And the shrunken line is going to become pulled with it. Just like so. And this way, the top gets to shrink, the bottom gets to expand, and the material stays cohesive. It doesn't tear itself apart. Doesn't this look suspiciously like the cross section of a bed from our 3D printer? But there's even more going on than that because our bed in cross section has this happening where there are holes drilled near the corners, and those holes have screws. So the screws hold the bed at the top here with that flathead screw and the screws go down through a spring, right? And then they attach to the sub bed down here. So let's draw a screw on this side. And of course they attach with a nut to the sub bed down there. So this bed that we drew here a minute ago uh, is primarily expanding along its length because the expansion coefficient is a percentage. So if you have more material, you have more material to expand percent by percent, which means you get a noticeable difference. You get a, a, a larger measurable difference in expansion along the length than along the width. But that's not to say that the width of this is not also expanding, because it is certainly expanding. Not very much, but it's expanding a little bit. So back to this, if our width is expanding, and it certainly is going like this as it gets hot, but you're holding it from the top surface with a rigid uh, screw head that can't move, because it's being held by the shank of the screw down here to the nut, where is it going to expand to? The spring here has to compress. So this bed is going to expand in this direction at the screws, which means that relative to your print nozzle, and here's your print nozzle on your printer, um, you're not going to notice any difference in the height at the screws, even though the bed itself has physically grown in size as it got hotter. This convexing is what would naturally happen when you're heat from the bottom and cooled from the top, which is the condition of our heated beds, right? The heating element, the printed circuit board uh, bottom heater is there radiating up to the top, whereas the cold air, maybe your part cooling fan, all that is blowing on the top. So by this reasoning, convexing should be what we see the majority of the time. So why is it the majority of the time our beds concave and the middle ends up being closer to our nozzle as we're printing? Why does this happen so much more frequently? The answer is because these screws complicate things even further. Even though they are on a spring, they, uh, still try to resist the springing. They're still trying to behave like somewhat rigid columns. So let's pretend like they are absolutely 100% rigid. So we'll just draw them as a column. Now, of course, I say they're rigid columns and they can't move, but everything moves at least a little tiny bit, right? So this will, these will flex just ever so slightly over to the side, no matter what we try to do. They will, they will do that. Okay, so what you have is a bed we're not cooling it from the top, it's just that the top is more cool than the bottom. So we actually have a, an aluminum bed which was machined and mounted to the sub-base in its cold state which has suddenly expanded. So this whole bed is now hot and it's all trying to expand outward. 
So because it's expanding outward, but we're holding it rigid here, that means that that growth has to go somewhere. It can't, it can't grow outward. We're holding it rigidly. So it has to either go this way or that way. But why does it go up? The answer is in the bend of the towers. The columns will slightly bend out like that. And because that's rigidly attached to the bed, you can see that's gonna happen just like so. So most often we see our beds popping up and creating a bubble in the middle. And Chep, to his credit, did measure the distance right there in the center of his bed. And he noticed that it did get closer to his nozzle. So he was getting the bubble effect just like this. So what can we do to uh, compensate for this issue. Well, looking at the top of our uh, beds, we could make the screw holes, not holes, but more sort of ovalized like so. As the bed expands, this would allow the, the screw heads to move uh, back and forth in the slots. But this is not a good solution. You're still gonna have all the friction from the spring and the washer pressing up against the bottom surface of the bed, which is gonna be resisting the slide of the, of the screw head back and forth. And it's, uh, it's, just, it's not gonna be as functional as you want it to be. You're still gonna get this bowing. So to eliminate that friction of those slots, maybe we wanna put some sort of a ball bearing underneath the bed. Um, and I don't know, maybe there's a ball bearing on the top and the bottom that sort of clamp it, but with ball bearings at all four corners, um, I guess if there's tracks for the ball bearings to go in, like they can only they can only go you know in this direction, um, that's going to constrain the bed uh, by four points, so it shouldn't swim around. It should stay where it's at, and your print should be accurate still. But wow, this is just getting way too complicated. Ball bearings just to hold the bed in place. So instead, what we do is we compensate for this in firmware. So we have our uh, bed probe, uh, the pin to probe on a Prusa. We've got, you know, the BL touch sensor, which is the superior solution. There's, of course, piezoelectric nozzles with a piezoelectric sensor. So when the nozzle hits the bed, it registers a, you know, a sound more or less through the piezo sensor. And, and that way we know the nozzles touch the bed here and touch the bed here. And then in software, we get a map of the bed. We can interpolate. Okay, so we measure this point, this point, this point, and this point. And the firmware can know that there's this much of a dome to the bed itself and we can compensate for that in, in software. So as the print is printing, the Z axis will lift up and then drop. So there you have it. Bed expansion is not a myth. Oh my God. <laughs> Uh, so hopefully you can now understand uh, the nuances, why your bed behaves the way that it does as it's heating, as it's warping. And you got to know that you need to measure your bed for firmware uh, when it's in its hot state. So if you're printing ABS and you're going to run a 100 degree bed, you get it up to 100 degrees. Then you do your, your mesh bed leveling algorithm or your ABL, whatever you want to call it. And then you print because you can't measure cold and then let the bed warp and then measure and then try to print on a warped bed. It's just, it's not gonna work out well for you. Now, if you guys wanna see a really interesting solution for bed leveling, check out the last video I made, I'll link in the description, where I used an Allen key as the bed probe. Pretty, pretty neat stuff. All right, big thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys make the videos happen. Without you, I wouldn't be here. And especially the Patreon supporters who are my producers and executive producer, you guys mean the world to me. Thank you so much. See you in the next video. Have a great day. Bye.